All right, so just so you guys all know, this is being recorded um, and I will email it to all of you um, probably tomorrow after it's done processing. So before we start today, I'd like to take a second to ask you all, um, because we have so many people coming on tonight, uh, to turn off your microphones and also to turn off your video. This really helps with the bandwidth um, and it helps the program run a little bit smoother um, without getting too choppy. Um, so if you could do that, I'd really, really appreciate it. And we'll totally turn them all back on at the end for any questions that you guys have. So um, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. My name is Liz and I'm an adult services librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Um, and today we're going to be talking about collecting and sowing native seeds. And I really got interested in this topic last winter sometime um, when I was starting to prepare our very first seed library. So we had never done this at our library before. And as I said a second ago, I'm kind of a gardening baby. I'm really interested in all of it, but I'm just learning a lot right now. Um, and so um, we bought most of our seeds uh, from a place called Prairie Moon, which is wonderful. Um, I always kind of sing their praises because they're very easy to work with and great education. Um, but I got to kind of thinking at that time that it would be really truly wonderful if we could keep things as local as we possibly could. So it would be great if we could um, have seeds from uh, gardeners in our area. That would be so ideal for us. So um, at, at that time, I asked Sarah if she'd be willing to talk on the topic, and we kind of started talking about it a little bit. So um, we did have to um, take away our seed library because of COVID, um, but I'm hoping that we'll relaunch again in February when we launched last year. It was wildly successful. Um, and at some point, we'll be putting out a call uh, for your seeds, any seeds you have left over, we don't want to take anything that you're planning on planting, but um, if you have something that you can spare us, we'd absolutely love to take it off your hands. Um, and we'll put out a call when we are ready to do that. So um, having said all of that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our presenter. Um, and let me just make you... I'm going to turn um, things over to our presenter, Sarah Mankel. Um, she's from the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Thanks, Liz. Sure. And if it's, everybody can just mute themselves, no. turn their videos off. No. I've got an echo happening here. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's try this. Yes, my name is Sarah McHale. I am the Community Engagement Specialist with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Um, and we're going to be talking about native plant seeds tonight. Um, if anybody has questions, you can put them in the chat box. I'll go through that at the end, okay? Um, so I'll just go through the presentation and then at the end, we'll go through as many questions as we can. And I'm also, you can see, I'm going to be giving you guys my email address too at the very end of the presentation on a resource page. Um, Liz said that she's going to be recording this presentation and sending it out as well. So you'll get that too, okay? Um, so my background real quick, I, uh, my degree is in ecology. My professional background is in environmental education. And um, I have been gardening and doing various kinds of restoration on my own property with native plants for I don't, about 12 years now or so. Um, and I'm just like a really big native plant enthusiast. And so I'm really excited to talk to you guys about this, this topic tonight. Um, it's something that's really, really interesting and very timely for this time of the year. All right, so the Land Conservancy, who we are, we are a nonprofit land trust located in about an hour Northwest of Chicago with that red dot on the map there. We're right on the border of Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, what a land trust is, what we like to do is we like to preserve and take care of land and work with the, the private landowners who wanna do the same thing. And we do that in a variety of ways. Um, we do that through education programs like this. And when we're able to do in-person programs, we do those as well. 
Um, we work with landowners who want to put a conservation easement on their property, which preserves it forever. Um, we have a restoration crew. We have a restoration ecologist and a restoration technician who work on our um, sites on doing restoration work and adding native seeds and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we have a farmland preservation program as well. And all of this is done with support from our volunteers and our members. So even if you're not here in McHenry County, if you're somewhere else, um, I highly suggest you find your local land trust. And you can do that at that website down there that says findalandtrust.org. Just type in your zip code, okay? And you'll be able to find your local land trust, reach out to them and go ahead and get connected. I'm gonna take one second and close this door because I hear my kids and they're loud. Okay, so find your local land trust, become a member, just get on their e-newsletter list, whatever it is, get involved with them, okay? And I'm gonna talk about some ways um, that people can get involved with us too. All right, so native seeds. And if my little box of me talking is in the way, you can grab that and move that out of the way or minimize it if you need to. Um, why do we care about native seed? Why not just buy some? Um, for one thing, if you've got these native plants, which are plants that have grown in a certain region for, for thousands of years with no human intervention. So if you've got these native plants on your property, why not use these seeds? That's potentially thousands of new plants, okay? Um, it's pretty easy, honestly, to collect some of these seeds. You can literally do it in five minutes with nothing more than a paper bag. Like you can see, this is my daughter, she's 12, on our front sidewalk collecting native plant seed. Super easy. Um, it's budget friendly. It's free once you got the plants in place. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to get native plants going from seed than it is with live plugs. Um, it's also extremely effective. So I can't even tell you how many plants I have showing up on my property that I put in from seed. It's amazing and it's like a treasure hunt discovery when you find these plants coming up from seed. It's also really educational. <laughs> um, you're forced to interact closely with the plants when you're gathering seed. And so you're learning about the different parts of the plants in a way that is very different from looking at a picture on the internet or in a book. Actually getting out there, being hands-on with the plant, that's the way to learn about your plants, okay? And it's also really therapeutic. <laughs> this is very, it's almost meditative. You're just kind of outside, it's very, it's like a no-brainer. You don't really have to think very much. You're just like just out there collecting seed. It's really, it's, I don't know, it brings your heart rate down. It's really nice. This little, this little girl, my daughter, she was really bummed about e-learning with coronavirus. And so, so we, I'm like, let's, do you want to help me? Let's go collect prairie drop seed right on the sidewalk. You don't even have to have shoes on. It's super easy. And it worked. It did help her a little bit. So just get out there and collect seed. It'll help all of us. All right, so the way I'm gonna address this program tonight is specifically for landowners, okay? And like homeowners. This isn't um, for people who are, you know, working for an agency who need to follow very specific <laughs> procedures, all right? I'm gonna make this as simple as possible using stuff you have laying around your house. You don't have to buy anything, all right? But there are some um, ethical things that you can follow. So procedures that you can follow to make sure that you're ensuring 
um, that you're not completely depleting all of the seeds. And the easiest way that, to do that is to just only collect 30% of the seed. So let's say you have a big group of purple coneflower, only collect 30% of that seed. Leave a bunch of it there for birds to eat. Leave a bunch of it there for the seeds to fall on the ground and scatter around and, you know, little critters to be able to eat and new seed to be able to grow into new plants. Now, obviously, if it's your own property, you can do whatever you want, okay? But um, these are kind of best practices that we follow. Um, if, it's, if it's an annual or a biennial or a super rare plant, out in the field, if you were collecting for an agency, they would say only collect 10% of that. Um, obviously, if it's your own property, you do what you want with that. Um, something that is extremely important is that you never collect seed from a property that is not yours without permission, okay? So whether it's, I don't care if it's a right of way along a road, um, I don't care if it's, uh, county forest preserve district site, a state park, whatever, whoever, whatever it is, you need permission from that landowner in order to be able to collect those seeds. Um, I know we at the Land Conservancy as a nonprofit, we do own some property along some very busy highways and there's some pretty great plants on some of those sites. And it would be really not okay <laughs> if people just thought it was all right to just go in there and collect seeds. I mean, basically that's poaching, okay? We depend on those seeds to restore our sites. Um, so just be ethical about getting landowner permission. Um, and just leave some seeds for the wildlife. So I'm showing you this picture, this little girl here, this is my niece. Um, this is a really weird patch of like blood root, which is a great wildflower, mixed with like periwinkle in my mom's yard. So we were collecting blood root seed pods. And uh, you can see I have those seed pods circled down there. Um, and she went to town and collected like every seed pod. And so then we like put the little seeds in the envelope. We just put them in a little envelope and then because we had collected too many of the seed pods, we basically wiped them out. We made sure to scatter a bunch of the seeds back on the ground. We want to leave some of those seeds for the ants to be able to eat and everything else. Okay. So what do you need? What do you need in order to be able to collect seeds? Stuff in your house that you probably have, okay? Things that are necessary are a pair of gloves. I like to use thin gloves um, that I can still feel what I'm doing. I don't wanna use real thick gloves for this work and a variety of sizes of paper bags. So like the paper bags you get at the grocery store or um, if you have those large landscape waste paper bags, those are great too. And I'll talk more about that later. And then the little lunch size paper bags those are great. Those are really the only two things you have to have. <laughs> um, the other things on the right side of the screen, those are kind of optional. Um, you can use one of those seed harvesting hooks, a small one. I do have a handheld one of that and I use it for a ton of other things besides seed harvesting. Um, but if you don't have that, it's fine. Just use a pair of sharp scissors to help cut some seed heads off. Um, pliers and a rolling pin. Those are things that can be helpful later on when you're processing, and I'll talk about what that means. And then um, if you wanna be fancy, you can use one of these uh, seed, the, I call it a bag, I call it a seed collecting bag. Um, Prairie Moon sells them on their website. They call them seed savers aprons um, or something similar. It's nice to have it, it's clipped around your waist so your hands are free, that's nice, okay? But I also will just like use one of those paper bags that has the handles on it and just kind of hook my arm through it. And then my hands are free that way too. So you don't have to buy stuff, okay? Oh, and Netflix, <laughs> that's helpful. 
TV is helpful for when you're processing all of these seeds later, and I'll talk about that too. All right, so let's, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through some of these um, different kinds of seeds that have different methods of dispersal. And I'm gonna try to hit at least one example from each group because those dispersal methods or the way that the seeds move around are going to affect how you collect them, all right? And one tip, that I'm going to cover. So I'm going to try to do this kind of chronologically. So these, I'm going to cover the seeds that are ripe um, from July onward to, to like July through October, those seeds. Because seeds that are ripe from July through October, November, whatever, those seeds um, are okay to keep for storage. Uh, to, to either distribute in the fall or the winter. Um, I'm gonna cover some spring seeds at the very end. Um, there's like, there's a few different kind of exceptions, but I'll cover that as we go. All right, so milkweed. Everybody wants to know about how to collect milkweed seeds. And um, it's about being proactive with, well, with all seeds, honestly, but especially with milkweed seeds because when the pods are fully ripe, is that one all the way on the right? You can see it's already starting to kind of explode. It's fluff all over the place. Then it's just really hard to kind of get those once they start flinging all over the place like that. So something you can do is you can either be super proactive and literally rubber band, like you can see down in the lower left-hand corner, you can rubber band a few pods to keep them closed preemptively. Um, or you can just walk around and grab the ones that are um, starting to kind of split open. So a lot of this just, in, just involves you walking around, staring at your plants a lot. <laughs> and that's how you're gonna learn about your plants, okay? So once those milkweed seed pods, and they might still be green, honestly, at this point, um, they're gonna start to split a tiny bit, or if you squeeze them gently and they start to split and, and you see that the seeds are dark brown, okay, those are ready to collect, all right? And so you can, just click that seed pot off, or you can pull it off in some cases, and keep it in a bag, all right? I don't collect the ones that are already starting to fling fluff all over the place. I just let those go. Um, so you can see in the upper left there, that is where it says no and yes. That is a picture of somebody opened that, that uh, common milkweed seed pod and those seeds are light brown. Those are not ready yet, okay? All these milkweed seeds, when they're ready, are gonna be that dark brown color. So then what you can do with them, you can either take the whole pod and just put it in a bag and whatever, just get a whole bag of pods in there, um, which is what I do. If you want to, you can separate the fluff and the seeds out from the pod, put all of the fluff and the seeds into a, a paper bag, put a couple coins in the bag, close the bag up and shake it around, all right? Those coins are gonna dislodge the seeds from the fluff. And then you can just like cut a little corner of the bag off on the bottom and shake it and those seeds are gonna come out and maybe your coins will come out too. <laughs> All right, so it's kind of a cool method to separate. You don't have to do that though. I mean, you can, you can literally just keep the pods in the bag open. This is a thing we want, we don't ever wanna keep things sealed up. And I'm gonna talk about this in the storage section. We don't ever wanna keep things sealed up and uh, they'll get moldy, okay? So we just need air circulation. So it just means leave the bag open, okay? Um, yeah, so I just, I just take the seed pods and when I'm ready to scatter the seed in the fall or winter, and I just, I don't know, I just like gather the ones that have fallen and I throw them out or I just separate them off of the seed fluff like by hand or I just fling them with the fluff attached to them, 
All right, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I've seen directions online for these like separators that people build with like PVC pipes and this whole situation. And if you wanna find that Monarch Watch, I think it's Monarch Watch, they have a crazy involved thing that you could build at home of how to separate large quantities of milkweed seed from the fluff, okay? Or you can just do the bag and the coin trick and that works too. Okay, so another kind of um, seeds are seeds that shatter. So that just means that these are seeds that when they are ripe, they're ready to be collected and you touch them, like the very smallest touch, they just shatter, they fall off, okay? So these are kind of fun and these are really easy to collect. So an example of a seed that shatters would be bottle brush grass, which is this one here. And I love gathering this one because it's super easy. Oh, if you're gonna gather a lot of these, um, wear gloves because <laughs> it can be kind of sharp when you're gathering uh, like where, where the little seed collects or connects to the stem, it can be kind of sharp. Um, I'm not wearing a glove in this video, but I'm gonna show you here. So you can see, you literally start at the bottom, you pull upwards and you're left with a bunch of little seeds. And it's the seeds are inside. If you can see where I put a circle on the right-hand side there, the seeds are down at the very kind of corner base of that whole structure. Those long pointy things are called awns. Grasses are going to have those little projectile things called awns. Different kinds of grass species are gonna have different lengths of awns, okay? You don't even have to know this terminology. <laughs> you just have to know how to get, when the seeds are dry and brown and easily fall off the stem, they're ready to be collected. That's a pretty good um, rule of thumb there. When things are dry and brown, they're usually ready to be collected, all right? Bottle brush grass is starting to dry. Even like three weeks ago, you were able to collect that one. Um, this is a great grass for woodlands and savanna, oak savanna restorations. It comes up right away. This is an expensive grass to purchase the seeds for. So if you, I get like a little nursery of these going up around my house so I can collect those seeds and use them out in my larger woodland restoration. And I live, you guys, I live in like a suburban neighborhood, a one acre lot in a suburban Chicagoland neighborhood. All right, so I'm not out in some big rural situation. Um, so the stuff that I'm doing here is applicable to all different situations. All right, so let's look. Oh, so we can collect seeds from shrubs too. <laughs> you can collect a seed from anything really, as long as you pay attention to it. So hazelnuts, hazelnuts, everybody should have a hazelnut in their yard. Let's just start with that. Um, they would have been, uh, historically, they would have been the most prolific shrub in the oak woods understory. All right, so they were found all over the place here in Northern Illinois. And this is a, this is a seed that also shatters. So not just grasses shatter, all right? This is another one that when it's ripe and you touch it, boom, it's just gonna fall right off the shrub. Um, the seed is this nut, the hazelnut, right? Like you can see up in the right-hand corner there and it's also down in the left-hand corner. And it's the nut itself when it's on the shrub is wrapped up in a pair of oversized, they're called bracts. Um, they look like big old eyelashes to me almost, <laughs> those crazy green things that are coming out from around them. So what you're supposed to do with hazelnuts is watch for them to turn brown, the bracts and the nut itself, and then collect them promptly before the squirrels. But let me tell you what happens in my yard. In my yard, what happens is the squirrels are taking these things before they're brown. They're taking them when they're green. <laughs> so um, 
I've been reading about what people do and they could, sometimes people will collect them when they're green and spread them out on tarps in the sun in a protected area from the squirrels. And they just keep drying them that way until they dry out properly, okay? So you'll get them before the squirrels that way. But I can tell you the squirrels, they get the majority of mine and I've got little hazelnuts popping up all over in my yard and my woods, it's pretty cool. So they do a good job of planting them too. Um, if it's too hard to, to kind of separate the nut from the bract, you can use pliers to get into it, all kinds of stuff. You don't have to do anything crazy with this. This is literally just, you can just toss these out in the woods over the winter. If you want to dig them into the ground a little bit, you can do that too. Okay, so another kind, and this is, you're seeing this in the woods and in your gardens right now. You're seeing this exact picture. Um, you're seeing things developing what looks like red berries. Technically, they're called droops on a lot of these wildflowers, um, just because it only has one seed inside of it. Look at that picture on the bottom left. You could see what that individual seed looks like. Uh, thanks to Melissa Greichen, our restoration ecologist, for taking those cool pictures, um, that one down there in the bottom left, to be able to show people what these look like. But it's a droop if it only contains one seed inside each berry-looking thing. Technically, berries have all kinds of seeds on the outside of them. Okay, anyway, whatever, it doesn't technically matter. Um, here's the exception to the rule. These are plants, these are seeds that you do not want to hold for months until you're going to scatter them out wherever you're going to scatter them. Anything that is surrounded by this fleshy berry surround, you want to either direct sow it, that just means you throw it on the ground right after you collect it. Like, Maybe you take it from this part of your yard and you walk over to this part of your yard and you just take one of those little berries and you throw it on the ground. That's what direct sow means. Um, you can also clean the flesh off of them and I suggest you wear gloves when you do that because some of these droops are gonna have irritating compounds in them. Um, so you can clean the flesh off if you want and store the seeds in a plastic bag in the fridge because that is a nice humidity level. Um, or you could just put the whole berry looking structure, put the, the whole, that whole seed head really in a bag with like moist sand. I would sew it within a week though. I wouldn't hang on to these. Okay, let's think, um, think about nature here. Oh, so this plant is called Starry False Solomon Seal. All the Solomon seals, the one with the blue hanging berries, all of them, anything with this fleshy surround that looks like a berry, personally, what I do, I just put them on the ground right away, okay? I don't hang on to them. I'm kind of like, I just take the easy route with a lot of this stuff, all right? And here's another example that we're seeing in the woods all over the place right now, Jack in the pulpit, okay? On, look on the bottom there, you see that bright red, it looks like a bright red group of berries. Those are just laying all over the woods right now. That is from Jack in the Pulpit, okay? See the one above it, that's when they're green. You don't collect them when they're green. You collect them when they're that dark red. And again, you can literally just take them, set them on the ground in a different place where you want them to grow, okay? Now, the reason for this is we don't want to let them dry out. In nature, animals would eat these, all right? They would go through the animal's digestive tract. They would be kept moist. Then they would be excreted out by the animal, all right? And they would be in basically fertilizer as they leave the animal's body. So these, these seeds are made to be successful in an animal digestive tract and then in what the animal leaves. It's a moist situation, all right? So we don't want to let them dry out. Nature does this best. So whenever we can mimic 
what nature does with these seeds, the more successful they're going to be in germinating and growing. All right, so this is a really common one. This is uh, what you're looking at is purple cone flower. So there's a bunch of plants that fall in the cone flower kind of group, or you could call them cone heads. And the reason that they're called this is, do you see on the picture on the left where I made the little triangle? That is a cone-shaped uh, central structure that all of the seeds and all of the, everything kind of attaches to. Everything in the cone head section of seeds is going to have that structure. And sometimes you don't see that until like way late in the winter when all the seeds have been picked off these plants, okay? Um, these are, these are very spiky. They're really difficult to handle with your bare hand. So you need to wear gloves with these. Um, and they're ready or ripe to collect when this seed head turns brown, basically. When it's brown and dry and there aren't any colorful petals hanging off of it. And what you're going to do is you're literally just going to snip that entire uh, coneflower seed head off into a paper bag, all right? And uh, like I said, you're gonna wear gloves to process this one. And I'll talk about processing at the end. Processing just means like removing all the extraneous plant material from around the seed itself. That's all processing means, all right? And you do processing of these seeds to remove as much of that stuff from around the seed as possible to speed up germination, all right? Because think about over time, if all of that stuff is left around that seed, it's gonna take longer for that to break down, all right? And for the seed to achieve germination. So the more you process it, the more quicker you're gonna see the plants show up in a lot of cases. Um, Okay, so wear gloves. You can use pliers to literally pull the individual seeds out. Now, the individual seeds, if you look, I circled them in yellow, both where they are when you rip open. This is, I literally took a knife and cut this <laughs> pale purple coneflower seed head in half this morning on my kitchen table to, to be able to show you where these seed heads actually are, where they're attached. So you can see where it's attached right off of that little cone structure there. And then what they look like when you separate the seed itself, you can see down on the very bottom. To me, it looks like a tooth. Some people say it looks like candy corn. Um, so that is the actual seed itself once it's separated from the structure. You guys, this is fascinating to start ripping apart your seed head. All right, and just start exploring and finding where's the actual seed. This is how you learn about your plants, okay? And it's super fun. Um, so people rip the seeds out with pliers or they'll put them in a paper bag and just stomp on it with their feet. <laughs> um, or you don't have to do any of that. You can literally just throw the entire cone out where you want it to grow and it'll just take a little bit longer and that's okay. Okay, so another um, group of plants to collect are the crumbly cone heads. These are my favorite to collect because they're usually soft <laughs> and they're, they're just, they're, they feel wonderful and they're usually pretty easy to collect too. They're not pokey, you don't have to wear gloves. Um, an example of the crumbly cone heads are, is the purple prairie clover, which you can see in bloom in the picture on the right there. Beautiful, short prairie plant, um, perfect for any full sun, dry to medium uh, soil moisture conditions. So these seeds, and I was just out there looking at mine today, um, if you grab at the very base of that seed head and, and you start to pull upwards, if you meet resistance at all, 
and they're not kind of crumbling off easily, it's not ready to collect, all right? If you grab at the base of that seed head and you gently pull up and they're just like fluffing off into your hands, they're ready to collect. Um, this one in the picture there on the left, that one's questionable about whether or not it's ready to collect. Because you can see that that stem is still pretty green. It might be ready. It's, it's really a matter of testing it with your hands, okay? But then you can see what the actual seeds themselves look like. The seeds are lodged inside the gray fuzzy hulls. You don't have to take the hulls off or anything like that. Um, you can literally just keep those in a paper bag and throw those out later, okay? Um, all right, so if you're meeting resistance on any of these crumbly cone heads when you're pulling up, don't just, just leave it on the stem. Visit it again a little bit later, okay? And all of these groups, you guys, Liz um, from the library, in today's email, she sent you, I sent her a link of a resource for you guys. That's an amazing resource that was put together by the Lake County Forest Preserve District here in Illinois. Um, so their ecologist, along with somebody from this guy named Dale from the Volunteer Stewardship Network, they put together this exhaustive collection of seeds and they're grouped into these groups like this crumbly cone head or cone flower group whatever with very easy to understand directions of of how to collect each individual species so and it's a group of like 12 different guides they they split it up into like summer prairie forbs Forb, that's just a fancy word for flowers, okay? So like, you know, plants that you can collect that are ripe in the summer um, in the prairie. And then they've got wetland ones. And then they've got the ones that are ripe in the spring. I mean, they're, it's amazing, okay? So I highly suggest that you check that out. It's going to be available soon through the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, Technically right now it's still kind of under revision. They haven't released it yet, but I got like the early version. <laughs> and that's what I sent to you guys. And it's excellent, okay? I learned a ton reading it. It's a really great guide. All right, foxglove beard tongue. So these, these are really interesting. These fall under beaks, okay? And it's neat. When you look at that picture down in the bottom, second from the left, that's my hand and I'm holding some seed heads in my hand. You can see how they look like little beaks. Each little seed pod, technically it's not a pod, but whatever. They, um, they look like a little beak. And when those beaks open, that is ready to be collected, okay? Um, these are extremely hard these little, these little beaks. I mean, I have to take my thumbnail and really press to get through it. And there's a bunch of little seeds inside each beak. So when the beak opens up, and there's a ton of plants that are beaks. So when those all open up, when they're brown and they open up, and you can literally, you can just pour those seeds right in your hand, or you can just clip at the bottom of that group of, of uh, beaks that you could see there. If you just clip on the bottom, take that whole thing, dump it right into a paper bag, okay? And then later, what I do, <laughs> I take a meat mallet, and I, so I put them in a, uh, I'll use like a couple Ziploc bags or something, and I put all the, the beard tongue seed pods in that Ziploc bag and I lay it down flat on a hard surface and then I take the flat section of a meat mallet and I beat it with a meat mallet gently so I'm not breaking the Ziploc bag but I just beat it and because they're really difficult to um to kind of break that seed coating or the the beak opening um these smell too it's really bizarre so if you're storing them, keep them in an open container. Um, yeah, don't keep them in a closed container, just kind of 
builds up. It's very weird. And yeah, you could use a rolling pin, the meat mallet, stomp on them, whatever, to kind of break them open. These are great for prairie and even savanna restorations because they come up within the first year or two, which is nice. So this is another one that is very commonly found in people's gardens, wild bergamot. Um, I'm trying to focus on plants that like we find in, that I commonly see in people's native plant gardens and in, on private property, okay? Um, so wild bergamot, this one, I love these seed heads. Oh my gosh, you guys, you take, take that seed head. I cannot walk past one of these without doing this. Take a seed head, just plop it right off when it's brown and dry like that, squeeze it and smell it. It's so citrusy and minty almost too. It's very weird. I love it. All right, so these are in the shaker group. All that means is when you turn it upside down and shake it, those seeds are gonna pour out into your hand if that seed head is ripe, all right? Um, so you can see what it looks like on the left there when it's blooming it's that like real pretty pale purple color um those those all those it looks like petals or technically have petals or florets whatever they all fall off and they leave those tube shapes behind it's called it's called a calyx all those little individual tubes they all have a seed in them okay and so that's what when they're ripe when they're dry and brown and crunchy looking, again, there you go, there's your clue. And the notice the stem is dry and brown and crunchy too. Turn them over and you can test it. Are they easily coming out my hand? Yes, they are. Okay, good. I'm going to collect from this area and look at each plant as you're collecting and literally just snip that whole structure off and dump it right into a paper bag, okay? I love collecting these. And you can see how tiny those seeds are too. Okay, so another group are the fluffy, <laughs> the fluffy group, fluffy seeds. And there's a ton that fall into this category. This is just one example, Joe Pie Weed. I see this one in a ton of gardens, ton of woods, wetlands all over the place. Um, Asters fall into this group, goldenrods fall into this group. Those asters and goldenrods are not ready now. Those are gonna be another month or so before those are ready. But the Joe Pie is ready right now. How do I know? I took that picture just a few days ago in my yard. <laughs> when the seeds look fluffy, they're ready to collect, okay? And this one, super easy. So I'm not going to snip off like try to grab that fluff and put that fluff into a bag. I'm literally just going to cut that entire structure off and then tip it upside down very carefully and put it into a paper bag. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. I'm not just like grabbing the individual fluff. I want the fluff to try to stay attached to the structure if possible. It'll keep it from blowing all over the place. Um, until I'm ready to go out and process it and then distribute it out wherever I want it to grow. Um, that applies to asters, that applies to goldenrods, any plant that's like fluffy and blows around and is distributed by the wind, okay? Use that process on it. This is a fantastic plant, you guys, for savanna restorations. If you've got space, it's a little aggressive for a small garden, but if you've got a lot of space, it's good. Okay, hitchhikers. So I wasn't even gonna put this one in here because usually people just rip all of these out of their gardens <laughs> because nobody likes it when seeds stick all over them. But one example of a really good hitchhiker um, that is found, I've got this one out in my lawn prairie seeded area is Desmodium or uh, pick trefoil. So this one, the little pods have the little seed inside each little section of the pod. How do you know when they're ready? When they start to stick to you, <laughs> okay? So you literally just start on the bottom and pull upwards to get a bunch of those seeds in your hand, all right? And then you can just put them in a paper bag and distribute them later over the winter, all 
right? So it's pretty simple. When they start hitchhiking, collect them. Okay, so these are really cool seeds. Seeds that fall under the ballistic category. These are catapulting seeds. Seeds are just fling really far away when they're ripe. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of plants in this category. Jewelweed is doing it right now. That's the plant here. And let me play this video. This is my daughter did, did this just the other day. It's super fun. There we go. There. See, as soon as you touch it and it's ripe, those little seeds come out. Jewelweed grows in um, like wet, disturbed kind of areas. Um, it's super fun. It's not one normally found in gardens, but you can find it right now. So if you find jewelweed with these little orange flowers and there's the little seed pods hanging under there, I'll show you this again. Um, do that. It's so fun. <laughs> All right. So there's other plants that are ballistic too. Um, geranium, so wild geranium, the violets, toothwort, uh, prairie flax. Those are more spring and summer ones. Um, but the, these are really interesting. So to collect these, this is tricky. So you've got to learn about the timeline for this plant. So jewelweed, if you want jewelweed, it's right now is when you're going to go do it. The other ones like the geranium, the violets, the toothwort, the prairie flax, you really got to watch them. Once those flowers fade, what some people will do is they'll cover the, the seed head um, with like mesh or cheesecloth. They make little seed collecting bags that you can pull closed on the bottom. And then you just like leave that over the seed pot until it explodes and then it explodes in the bag. The other thing you could do is if you're really good, you can cut that seed head off just before it's gonna explode and Cut it off without making it explode. So you really got to be familiar with, with its like timeline and then just have it in a closed <laughs> paper bag and it'll explode in the paper bag when it's ripe. Okay, so you can do that with some of them. I personally have never done that with any of the ballistic seeds. They just fling themselves around in my gardens and grow where they want. But it's kind of a fun experiment to try if you want to try it. Right? Ballistic seeds, don't hang on to them for months. Sow them within a few days, okay? So go, just like let them fling in your bag or whatever, and then go put them on the ground. Surface, put them on the ground. You're not burying them. Just literally put them on the soil surface where you want them to grow, okay? Yes, animals might eat them, whatever. Okay, let's play a game. So <laughs> this is called Ready or Not. And I'm gonna test your knowledge here. Now, after we went through these different seed groups, those are all the different groups. The fluffy ones, the ballistic ones, the shattering ones, whatever. So I'm gonna show you two, a picture on one slide. On the left, it's gonna be number one. On the right, it's going to be a picture of number two. It's the same seed heads, but I want you to just visually look at them and think, is this ready to collect or not? You don't have to like, just yell your answer out. You don't, you don't need to unmute yourself. Don't, please don't unmute yourself. <laughs> I don't know how many people are watching right now, but that could be chaotic. I'll tell you what the answer is, but just yell it out even while you're muted just to have fun. Okay. Okay, ready or not, hopefully you can see both of these seed heads. Number one on the left, that thimble weed. See what the picture, the flower looks like there down in the center. And then we got the thimble weed on the right. Number two is on the right. Number one's on the left, you guessed it. Number two is ready to collect. So this is one of those crumbly cone heads. You see how it's just, these are my favorite to collect you guys, this group. See how they just look like soft, beautiful, cottony fluff. It's starting to do that. Yes, number two, ready to collect, very good. And these pictures, you guys, these are all pictures 
that I took on the same day right next to each other. So all these different seeds, even of the same species, they can kind of ripen at different times. So you just got to keep looking at your plants, okay? Because they just do their own thing. All right, here we go. We've got uh, purple cone flower number one on the left and purple cone flower number two on the right. And number one is dry and brown and crumbly looking. Look at that. Number two still has a bunch of color, even has a little bit of purple petal still hanging off of it. The stem is bright green still on number two on the right. So you guessed it, number one is ready to collect. Very good. <laughs> All right, so again, that's a cone flower. That's one that we would just snip that whole thing off and put it in a paper bag and then like mallet it or rip it out with pliers or however you wanna go about dislodging those seeds from there. Okay, Golden Alexander. This is a great one for prairie or savanna restorations because it comes up right away. It's a little aggressive for a small garden. Um, on the left, number one, and then on the right, number two. And I'm not gonna give you clues for this one because I really want you to look at it, okay? And see if you could just visually determine which one you think if you saw these two, because these were right next to each other in the woods at the same time, which one would be ready to collect? And yes, number one. <laughs> Very good. Number one, dry and brown, right? It looks almost dead. Number two still has a bunch of color on it, both in the stem and the seeds themselves, themselves are, are green. All right, and then Final one, this is tricky. This one's tricky. I'm gonna show you two videos, okay? So we've got compass, or not compass plant, prairie dock here, all right? So here's a seed head from this one. And the seeds are those big crumbly guys, not the little tiny skinny floret things. All right, so we got that one versus this one. Okay, yes, number one, <laughs> the one on the left, that one is ready to collect. And look at the picture down in the bottom right corner, that shows you what the actual seeds are. This one's a little tricky, okay? This is one where you would need to kind of rip the seed head apart to find those little seeds, not the little individual florette tube things in the middle, okay? So this one's kind of fun. Okay, so how do you store your seeds? I've been telling you like put them in a paper bag and what do you do with them? So if you're me, you leave them just like laying in various parts of your house where mice and bugs can't get to them. <laughs> Random places like the top of my washer or my kitchen counter right next to a bottle of mescal. I don't know, that's just where they ended up. So really, really <laughs> what you need to do is make sure that the bags stay open. Uh, you don't want your seeds to mold, okay? Those seed pods, they hold moisture and you do not want the seeds to mold. They might not germinate, okay? Um, Keep them open for air circulation. Don't keep them stored in plastic unless I told you to, unless it was those berry ones and you're keeping them in the fridge. Um, and those need humidity. The rest of these don't want humidity. Um, keep them in paper, not plastic, okay? Uh, keep wherever you keep this stuff, your basement, your garage, wherever it is, don't keep it where mice can get into it. As it starts to get colder, mice are going to be moving in and they will just have a smorgasbord on these seeds. Uh, I like the really big, large lawn waste bags. Um, and I use the same ones from year to year to year. And I'll keep those individual little bags like inside those, just loosely inside there open. You can keep the species all separated if you want to. Um, in little individual bags, like you see I did there on top of my washer dryer. Um, or you can mix them all up. If you know that a bunch of the seeds are all gonna go in the same place in your yard, then it's fine to mix them all up. You just do what you want. 
Um, insects may appear from some of these seeds. You can see that's from my dryer today, that little critter crawling around, crawled out of one of those bags. So keep that in mind when you're deciding where to store these bags of seeds. Okay, processing. Let's talk about that really quick. This is just a fancy word for separating that plant material from the seed itself, okay? Here's a video. This is my daughter um, processing gentian seed heads, okay? Gentian, the cream gentian is that little white flower on the bottom there. So it's very simple, all right? Um, you don't have to do this processing step. You can literally just take entire seed heads and throw them out onto wherever you want them to grow. Um, but if you do this, like I said, it speeds up the process. Tools, wear some gloves, especially with those prickly seed heads. Um, Buckets, paper bags, whatever you've got. Tarps are good to lay down on the ground or your table, wherever, because it makes a mess. Maybe you could use scissors, tweezers, pliers, that meat mallet, rolling pin, just stuff that you've got laying around, okay? And you're just gonna kind of sit there. I do it, we do it over the winter, like while we're watching movies or Netflix, and we just process by hand, okay? And you're literally just, each individual seed head, you're taking it out of one bag and you're getting the seeds separated into another bag. Then the leftover plant material, I keep that stuff. I put that in another bag and I throw that stuff out wherever I'm putting my seeds too. I don't care if it's my prairie garden or my, my bigger section of woods. I want that organic material out there. Okay, I want all of that included. It's important. Um, okay, keep the species separated or combined. Whatever you want to do, it's up to you. This is cool and fun to do with kids. It's, it's kind of fun. After processing, I just mixed a bunch of my seeds together because I knew I wanted all of these to go in my woods. And this is what it looked like on my dining room table. Super great place to put them. Um, sowing. All right, so what do we do? So that just means flinging your seeds. Um, you're doing it by hand, okay? And <laughs> I do it in the winter. So usually there's snow on the ground when I'm out sowing my native plant seeds. Native plant seeds a lot of times need a winter cold period to break dormancy. Think about it. That's what would happen in nature if we weren't here to move the seeds around, okay? So I like to throw my seeds out on top of the snow. It lets me see where I've actually put them. I loaded up a bunch of stuff, first in a wheelbarrow, and then was like, yeah, wheelbarrow's not gonna work in the snow. Put it in a sled, got that sled out to where I wanted all my stuff to go. And then I just kind of started throwing it around where I knew I wanted it to be. I didn't get to properly processing every single seed head. Not a huge deal. You can see in that bottom right picture, I literally have just some full seed heads that I just threw out there too. Oh well, not a big deal. At least the seeds are out there. Okay, so um, you can distribute your seed whenever you want to. It could be fall, winter, or spring. Technically fall and winter are the best times. Um, the native grasses do really well in the spring too. If you want a certain area, you could flag a certain area and seed in there before the snow flies, and you're literally just doing it by hand, okay? Seeds can take years to germinate. You need to be patient. Don't expect that you, because you put one milkweed seed right there, that the next year it's gonna grow. Like, that's just not how it works. It can take, all these different plants have different, um, seed germination needs, all right? So Prairie Moon Nursery, their website has germination codes for every type of plant. And so you can look up the codes and look, look at how long it can take some of these seeds to actually grow. Um, while you're waiting for your seeds to germinate, don't let weeds make seeds. <laughs> Cut them down, all right? And that's a whole nother program. Okay, super fast, because I'm going over time here. 
here's some spring blooming plants and everybody always forgets about the seeds from these everybody remembers the looks at the flowers and they're so beautiful you know in like april may early june and then the flowers go away and everybody forgets about them guys get the seeds from these okay a lot of these seeds are spread by ants so they have those little white structures on there called eliosomes it's like this fatty, sugary, whatever, I don't know, probably protein to substance that ants want to eat. They take that seed, they go underground in their tunnel, they eat the eliosome, it looks like a little white gummy worm, and they discard the seed into like a waste chamber in their ant tunnel system. The waste chamber is full of dead ant bodies and like ant excrement. Perfect growing situation for this wildflower seed. It then grows. Awesome. So you can take these little seed pods, like here, blood root. There's a ton of woodland wildflowers that move around this way. And when you gently squeeze that seed pod, if it starts to pop open and the seeds are deep, dark chestnut color, and you can see the eliosome on it, take that seed pod and immediately put it somewhere. Okay, direct so put them on the ground right away. All right, so explore your plants, even after the flower petals are gone. Look for these seed pods. Spring beauty is another one that's going to move around with these eliosomes. All right, after those little petals are gone, this is a beak. Look at the beaks, the little beak and a structure there, the little seeds are inside there. As soon as those beaks open up, you can start to collect those. Sow them within a day or two. Ginger, love this plant. Um, this one, the seeds are hidden. So look at that picture, the pictures on the left there. You have to literally, when this seed, when this structure is on the ground, when it starts to look rotten and mushy, in June, you gotta like kind of rip open the bottom part of it there, and that's where the seeds are. They're not in the open uh, top section, they're hidden. It's kind of fun. And you literally just take that and put it where somewhere else where you want it to grow. Prairie smoke, so many people have this in their landscaping. As soon as you're able to gently touch um, that feathery plume structure, and the seed, you can see the seed on the right, starts to dislodge very easily. You're gonna take those and you're gonna put them in the ground right away. These are all these early spring and early summer species. They need to be sowed or distributed right away, not held on to for months, okay? Um, oh, here's a big bowl of prairie smoke seed. That's fun, I did that. Okay, so we are having some fall seed sharing events. Um, they're limited to, to only the Land Conservancy members. Um, so you can become a member on our website or find your local land trust, see if they're doing the same thing. Um, we've been having a seed sharing event for years and years and years. We have to do a different version of it this year because of coronavirus. Uh, but we're gonna have a bunch of different seed collecting events throughout the fall. You can come collect seed, you keep half of it, we keep half of it, all right, for our restorations, okay? And you can bring seed to share if you want to, and we can all kind of share seed with each other. It needs to be labeled, and it needs to only be straight native species of plants, no cultivars or anything like that. Um, become a member and then you'll be on our email list to get the email for like when these seed collecting events are going to be here's some resources <laughs> you want to buy seed top those are some areas some and you're here in the upper midwest those are some reputable places to get native seed and um, to learn about landscaping and using seed that's a great book garden revolution by larry wiener and then I've got a bunch of other kind of references. Honestly, my favorite resource is the one that Liz emailed to you guys today, okay? That's going to be coming out through the Field Museum soon. The Field Museum does have one out right now. 
it's not nearly as many plants as the one that Liz sent you guys earlier, okay? Um, you're gonna be sent this as a recording, so you'll have this page as well. Um, we have a Facebook group through the Land Conservancy that we started called Learn. It's a private Facebook group, so you can post questions on there, all right? And we'll answer your questions or other botanists, restoration ecologists, private landowners will all jump on and answer your questions. So that's a good resource to look for as well. Okay, I went over by a little bit. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm going to... Uh, Liz, should we pull up the chat? I don't know if you, if you want to go through and answer any questions here. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, go ahead. Do, do you want to um, glance through and pull out questions that yeah. you would like to talk about? Yeah. So my email address is here on this page, down on the bottom, smichale at conservemc.org. Okay, um, all right, this is the thing about chat is there's like 5 million things in here. Okay, um, do you know of any seed libraries in Kane County? I don't know, Liz, do you know of any? Because I don't know. I don't, sorry. Okay. okay. I mean, you can come on and visit ours, but you know, it won't be up for yeah. a while. Yeah, and I mean, if you become a member of the Land Conservancy of McHenry County, we're doing seed sharing. We don't care where you live. As long as you're a member of our nonprofit land trust, that's how we do the work we do. Okay, there's only like eight or nine of us that work for the Land Conservancy. We depend a ton on member support, okay? Um, all right. Easiest native plant to start collecting, storing, and sowing. Probably black eyed Susan. Like everybody's got black eyed Susan. That one's so easy. Okay. That's one of the cone heads. Um, so that one's extremely easy to collect. Just snip it off. Those are going to come up in the first year that you throw those seeds out. Okay. So black eyed Susan is a super simple one. Actually, all of these are easy. Like all the ones I went through tonight are extremely easy. Um, to use. And I tried to make it in a way that was very simple. Let's see. How do you separate seed from fluff on Joe Pie? Don't. Just don't separate it. Just literally just throw the fluff out with the seeds. It's okay. You can walk around and step on it, all right, after you've thrown it. If you're, if you're worried that it's just going to like fling away somewhere, don't even separate it from that. I wouldn't. I would just throw it out with the fluff. That makes it the easiest. How do you store the seeds? Okay, I went through that already. Um, <laughs> Netflix. Something you watch when you're... I don't know. Um, oh, Melissa jumped in with a comment. Thank you. Okay, so... Sorry guys, I'm just, I'm having to like scroll through. Always wash your hands after handling milkweed. Yes, the sap can be toxic. Yup, that's why wearing gloves is a good thing to do. Um, would Jack in the Pulpit be one that would apply for seed gathering and sowing? Okay, good. Yup, just throw it. Jack in the Pulpit, throw it out right away. Possible to collect pine cones from white pine trees and grow new white pine trees. Yeah, so pine cones, you got to kind of rip them apart and find the little seeds inside. Um, yeah, I personally haven't done that, so I can't answer that question. But in nature, yes, you should be able to take that seed. So I would, I would look that up, all right? I would Google that question. Which seeds require stratification to increase germination? A lot of them do. So this, okay, this webinar is not touching propagation. All right, that's a whole nother topic. Propagation is when you're taking those seeds and you're, you're doing certain things to them to get them to germinate right away, all right? I'm not doing any of that. That's a ton of work. If you want to learn about germination and the seed codes and stratification, all that, Prairie Moon Nursery's website 
has a great description of what to do for each of these little seeds. Personally, I let nature do it for me. So the ones that need stratification, that's literally, that just means like they need a cold period where they're gonna maybe be like drawn down into a crack in the soil and then it freezes and it thaws and it freezes and it thaws. I let nature do that, okay? And I can tell you, I see pretty darn good germination out in my woods and my prairie and my gardens. Um, so that's the simplest way to do it, is to not overthink it, but you can do it, okay? Like with some moist sand in your fridge, there's certain seeds that need that, all right? So go to Prairie Moon's website, because there's a ton of them that need different things. Um, okay. It yes. seems like a lot of the um, grasses need uh, the cold stratifying, as I've been writing up the copy for all of the packets and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Cool. There's Some a of the wildflowers. Yeah. Ton of them that need that. And it makes sense when you think about it, right? Because all these would be having their seeds and then winter comes and that's when a lot of them fall off. So it makes sense that a lot of the grasses and other things need cold stratification. Um, all right. If I've already pulled the seed heads off of Joe Pie weed, rather than cutting off the seed head, what would be the process? It doesn't matter, you still just throw the seeds out there, okay? I'm just telling you how to do it the easiest way, easiest, fastest way possible was to cut that entire structure off and stick it into a paper bag. But then when you're ready to distribute the seed, you're literally just taking the fluff and kind of throwing it out where you want it to go, all right? Um, okay. Do some seed heads ripen after collection? Yes, some do. Um, and I can't, oh, that's, that's a difficult one that you're gonna need to learn by trial and error. So yeah, some, some of them will and some of them won't, all right? It's a, so I encourage you to look through that resource. If you have questions about individual plant seeds, I encourage you to look at that link that Liz sent you today because it literally lists all the individual native plants and what they're going to need. And usually like families of plants, like all the cone flowers, they all kind of need the same thing. Okay. Or, or whatever they, you know, a lot of the grasses, they all need the same thing. So when you kind of start to learn what that is. Okay. Um, let's see, bee balm. So bee balm is what I showed. So that's Minarda or wild bergamot. So I showed that one. How long do I leave the dead seed heads on the plant? So I went through that. Hopefully I already answered that one. As soon as those are dry and brown and crunchy and you tip that seed head over and tap it into your hand and the seeds fall out in your hand, it's ready. Okay. And those, you can hold on to those and so just throw them out anytime between October and February. That's generally the best time to be throwing out those seeds that you've collected from July onward. Okay. October to February is usually the best time to sow seeds. Okay. Wondering in terms of invasives. Do not allow unripe invasive seed heads to ripen. Yeah, absolutely, don't do that. Don't put them in your compost either. Does bagging them in black bags for solarization heat enough to stop the seeds from ripening? It can, yeah. So, so like garlic mustard um, flowers, like garlic mustard. So garlic mustard is one that like, if you collect that flower, and then just leave it laying out, it can still just make seeds, even after you've separated that flower head from the plant. So if you just put all those garlic mustard flower heads into black plastic bags, and even you could put a little bit of water in there and leave it in the sun, that'll solarize and kill them, okay? And that's a good way to deal with it that way. Never put them in your compost. Never let invasives make seeds, okay? That's the big goal. 
Um, <laughs> drinking their best call right now. Okay, a shoe box. Yeah, you can use a shoe box. Sure. Absolutely. For cone flowers. Yeah. Get creative with like stuff you have around your house. Amazon boxes. Absolutely. Whatever. Um, yeah. Butterfly milkweed. Sure. Put it in a box. That's totally fine. Um, two blocks of wood with sandpaper on to rub seeds between. Sure. You can do that too. Crush the seeds in the process. You can get creative with that. Yes. How do you prevent birds from going after seeds if they're scattered on the snow? All right, so here's what I do. Right before it's going to snow, so like a couple hours before it's gonna snow, I like run out there and start throwing my seeds around, all right? Because then the snow covers it up. So that's a trick um, that you can try if you've got snow in, in your area. Um, Hold the take cone flowers, put them in a paper bag and shake for the seeds. Um, I got little black seeds out. What are those if the seed for cone flowers are the prickly part? Okay, so the seed for the cone flower, if you look back at my <laughs> picture, it's not the prickly part. That's not the actual seed. I circled what the seed was. It's below that prickly part. All right, and it's the thing that looks like a little piece of candy corn. I mean, it's smaller than candy corn. I said it looked like a tooth. That's the actual seed. So, so take a knife, cut one of these cone flower seed heads open. Don't be afraid, you guys, to just really get in there <laughs> and find the actual seed. That's gonna help you learn about the structure and what you're looking for when you're out collecting these seeds, okay? Um, bag and coin method work for fluffy seeds like asters, goldenrods. I don't think it's going to because those seeds are so tiny compared to milkweed. I would just distribute that fluff from the asters and goldenrods attached to the seed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to separate them and I would step on them. Okay. After I, after I fling them around, I would step on them and get, Get them to stick to the soil, stick to the snow. Um, okay, good, yes. Prairie moon has germination codes to tell what the seed needs to germinate. I don't think they tell how long the seed may take to germinate. They start growing when they're ready. It could take several seasons. Yeah, it can. Um, oh, explain how to collect liatris seeds. Yeah, so liatris, um, and again, this is in that resource I sent to you guys. Um, they're going to be ready at different times up the stalk. So you got to kind of wait until the fluff kind of starts to appear and then you can pull that off and collect that. Okay, so just watch them. Um, are you okay with glancing through the chat? And Oh, yeah, sure. I'm okay with that, Liz. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going down. Oh, how important is it to gather seeds that are close to your area? How much do the genetics vary from region to region? Great question, Anna. Okay, I think it's important to, to use seeds that are locally sourced as close to you as possible. Black-eyed Susan, let's just take that as an example. Black-eyed Susan grows all over the place, okay? All over the country, I'm pretty sure. Black-eyed Susan that grows in Texas is going to be exposed to a different climate than black-eyed Susan that grows in northern Minnesota, okay, natively. So if I live in Minnesota, I don't want black-eyed Susan seed from Texas. I want it from Minnesota where it's used to my growing season, okay? It's used to the length of growing season I have. It's used to my winters. It's used to the particular soil conditions that I have in Minnesota, whatever. Yes, try to use seed that's collected from within 100 miles of you, if possible. If not, don't sweat it, but try to do that as much as you can, okay? Um, so that's why the genetics, yeah, that's how that's related. Is it necessary to rake seed into the soil? You don't have to do that. I have done that before on a prepared site 
where I like killed the grass and it was bare soil and I had a lot of expensive seed that I purchased to put down, okay? I did rake it into the bare soil. Um, you don't have to do that though. That's literally the only time I've done that in like, you know, eight years or whatever. Um, you can just, just throw it, just surface sow it onto, onto, into leaves even, okay? Into leaf litter. Um, I recommend you don't sow seeds on top of mulch. Get rid of your wood mulch, guys. You don't need wood mulch. Get plants to be your mulch, <laughs> all right? And just sow directly into that. If you've got wood mulch, don't, don't seed into that, okay? Um, my email address is not visible, covered by Zoom interface. Oh, that's a bummer. Okay, Liz, can you put my email address in the chat maybe, possibly? S-M-I-C-H-E-H-L at conservemc.org. Um, all right, she can't, Karen can't find the email, Liz, that you sent with the info that you mentioned when it was sent. So maybe, Liz, when you resend out this recording, you could put that link in there again. Yes, okay? I will we'll do that. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. we'll make sure everybody gets that, okay? And maybe I'll see your slides. Yes, sure. Yeah, she can send my slides out and you can send my email address out to people too. Sure. To make sure everybody gets that. Okay. Um, good for semi-shade. There's like a million. So <laughs> if you go to Prairie Moon Nursery's website, you can put in what you want. Shade, semi-shade, sun. I want the plants to be this height and it'll filter it down for you, okay? There's a ton of things that are awesome. For semi-shade, we would call that a savanna, okay? There's a lot of plants that grow in that that are great. Um, thanks, Melissa, for your... So our restoration ecologist apparently watched this tonight and she's been answering some questions in the chat too. So that's awesome. Thank you. Melissa taught me so much of this stuff. And if you come to any of our seed sharing days, Melissa and I are doing those together. Okay. So you'll get to meet her too. And we have a ton of fun doing it. Um, all right. Good, 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 good. Ooh, Cardinal. How about seed from cardinal flower? Yeah, it's not ready yet. I just looked at mine, at least in my yard, it's not ready. Um, yeah, you just, you gotta wait for it to be brown-ish and crumbly and then when you tip it and the seeds fall out, those are super tiny seeds, okay? I don't remember if cardinal flower is a beak or not. It's in the resource that Liz sent out. Um, just watch it when it's brown and crumbly. So again, guys, there's so much you can learn from just staring at your present or at your uh, staring at your plants. Okay, I think I made it. I think I made it through, Liz. I think I made it through all the chat. So if <laughs> if anybody else for restorations, what sites do you recommend? I don't know what she means by that. Um, Maybe website. To do, to do restorations, to learn about restorations, um, I recommend, well, for one thing, you could use our Learn Facebook group. There's a restoration page, I don't have it on here, but where they did some, um, it's called Pleasant Valley Conservancy, and it's up in central Wisconsin. So if you just Google Pleasant Valley Conservancy, I don't know, maybe Wisconsin or something. It's in the Madison area. They've got amazing information on there, okay, about, especially about Oak Savannah restoration. Read through their past blog articles. It's crazy, all right? We also have what's called an Oak Keepers webinar. Um, Oak Keepers is just like how to restore your oak woods. We've got that upcoming webinar. Um, not next week, but the week after. Look on our website, it's on there, or on our Facebook page, it's an event. So that's on how to restore um, your oak savannas. I have my how to convert lawn to prairie uh, for prairie situation, so that's on our website too, as a downloadable webinar link, okay? Um, yes, 
All right. Oh, wild ones. Sure. That's a, yeah. Wild ones, natural landscaping. That's a great resource as well. You could find your local wild ones group. That's a national nonprofit that has local chapters all across the country. Their whole goal is to get native plants into people's yards. Okay. And to just learn more about what is going on with native plants. Okay. All right. I think I made it, Liz. We did it. Thank you guys so much <laughs> for joining us tonight. I encourage you to find your local land trust, um, findalandtrust.org, go to our website, get their e-newsletter list, volunteer, become a member, donate money, donate seeds to them. We take seed donations. That's what we use, guys, for our restorations. Um, only native seed, only labeled native seed. <laughs> but we take that too. So that's great if you're looking for what to do with your seed. Give it to your local land trust to use in their restorations. Or Liz, what are you guys doing with your seed library someday? Yes, yep, we'll need it at some point. Yeah. So if you guys uh, are, are open to sharing it, we'd love to have it. Um, I'm not sure yet uh, when we'll be able to take it because of COVID, but I'm guessing probably pretty soon. I would just write what you've got on the envelope and um, when we're ready, just drop it off and I'll get it and we'll throw it in there and somebody will take it and be thrilled. That's awesome. That's such a cool thing that you guys are doing. That's awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for watching tonight. I went way over 826, whatever we made it through. <laughs> It's all good. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks for coming, everybody.